this is a new platform to me, so bear with me slightly as I click between slides, I think, and I hope I can see, yeah, hopefully you'll see a map. So a little tiny bit of context before we dive in um, on the GeoMap tool. And the first case study we put out was actually the continent of Africa. And there's a lot of rationale behind selecting Africa as the first area, and it was twofold. One, we wanted to highlight underestimated and untapped geothermal potential, particularly in regions with growing population centers and where new cleaner energy resources are desperately needed. So obviously Africa fits that objective. The second objective actually relates to data accessibility in Africa. And the continent is, for those who've worked in oil and gas and in geothermal currently probably knows this, that it's one of the most challenging in terms of accessing data and having available data within the public domain. And the view really was if we can design and create a database in Africa, then we can more quickly um, adapt this to geographies that have much more accessible and robust data sources. And we will unfold and deliver these continental scale projects um, based on what you see in the map. So we started in Africa. The team are actually working North America currently. They'll move on to South America. We'll shift over to Southeast Asia. And Europe and Oceania are remain the end, the stage four and five. And the reason really is because they, in many respects, are so advanced in their collective development of subsurface data sets. So there's huge efforts going on in Europe with a European wide map and the Australian, New Zealand governments do an amazing job in putting out data. There is obviously lots of data in the US, but actually it's state by state. So bringing it together is quite a challenge. It represents a very different challenge to Africa. In Africa, we were in creation mode. We actually had to create data sets. In the US, we're in collation mode. So it's quite a different challenge, but both, um, both worthy of the task. So that's a little bit about what you'll see in the, geo in the tool online really the details around the African continent. Okay, so let's go through some of what we have in our research portfolio. What you see on your screen is an exploration triangle, and this is a common tool used for designing exploration programs in oil and gas. It's been adapted many, many years ago by geothermal, and it's also, I see it adapted by natural hydrogen and even CCUS to some extent. And the goal here of the first phase of our research was to create a robust base of this triangle. And we, we get asked this a lot. Well, you know what, you can't drill a well in this. Why don't we go right in for prospects? But there are, there's good steady rationale why we build the base and the foundation first. And the research approach that we had was that very early on, we recognized that there's quite an extensive and varied expertise needed to fulfill the research and no single institution can manage the scope alone. So consequently, it turns out that our research program actually engages 85 experts globally from very, very different uh, institutions. And these include universities, they include consultant companies, they, some of them include service companies. And this is quite a unique pro approach. So we have actually designed and we are managing our research grant and our program, and it actually guarantees to us the involvement of really top tier geosciences and experts. And therefore the output is the production of really high quality data. So the tool, what you can access online and the data layers that you have available to you really address those first two layers of that triangle. And there's a difference between those two layers. The first layer, the bottom layer, is all about understanding the different layers of the earth across the mantle and the sediments. And these are aspects in many respects that we cannot see, and they often require geophysical methods and, as, and their associated inversion techniques to understand. And many of our research programs today that I'll discuss address these layers, and they focus on aspects like understanding and refining the thickness of both the crust and sediment, trying to establish a depth to lithosphere, a stenospheric boundary, so the lab, and really then overlaying the lateral and very um, horizontal variations in the com composition, because these are critical for conductivity and radiogenic heat production. 
The second layer up, which we also have researched around, is more observationally driven, and it encompasses elements that we can observe on the surface. And these might be volcanoes, geysers, igneous intrusions, or tectonically active areas, so faults that are moving today or have moved in the recent past. And when we couple these two layers together, they give us an understanding of where geothermal energy is favourable with regards to the subsurface. To move up the triangle, that will be the focus of next year and subsequent years. But in order to progress up the triangle vertically, it's critical to understand the base because that's really, and it has been always in oil and gas, it's really what dictates where you should focus, where you should place your time, your energy and your resources. Because as you move up this triangle, it becomes more expensive, you require more data, you require more time. So you want to really focus your attentions in the right places. And that's the idea behind developing the base of the triangle so robustly. So if we, I'm clicking, clicking. So before we get into the details of the individual research programs, I just wanna to touch on a few terms because geologists and geophysicists use these terms sometimes differently. So let's just make sure we are all on the same page here. So the Earth since its formation, we know has been in a process of cooling down. And it does this while also generating new heat from the decay of radioactive minerals. And the way the Earth loses heat is actually very similar to how our bodies release heat. It's not equal everywhere. We lose more from our heads than you know, from our stomachs. And in the same way as we can measure our body's heat loss by using a thermometer, at the surface, we can also measure the Earth's surface heat loss. What we measure at the surface is variable and it fundamentally depends on the contributions from three different sources, the mantle, the crust and the sediments. If we look at the mantle first, the mantle contribution to heat is inversely proportional to the lithosphere thickness. And that's why so much of our attention is placed in understanding the depth to the lithosphere zenith boundary. And I will use the term lab for this layer, okay? I'm a basin modeler, and to me, as a basin modeler, the lab has always represented an isotherm. It represents different things to different people. To a geophysicist, it's a velocity change. To a geologist, it's a layer in a fundamental layer in the crust. To a modeler, it's an isotherm. And, the and this is the temperature of what melt occurs, and it's often referred to as the 1330, meaning at 1330 degrees C. That's this layer. And a thinner lithosphere corresponds to a much higher mantle heat flux. And the lithosphere is, we know, thickest in old stable continents. And this can be between 200, 250 kilometers. And these tend to be cold. And the thinnest lithosphere is in newly formed oceanic crust. And we know this to be hot. So it's a really fundamental layer that we need to understand for geothermal and to understand the, geo the gradient throughout the lithosphere. If we move up to the crust, thicker crust tends to generate more heat production due to the presence of radiogenic isotopes. So uranium, thorium, potassium are all important, particularly in the upper part of the crust. The amount of decay depends completely on the geology, but where you have areas of very thick granitic crust, actually the contribution of the total heat flux of the surface can be up to 50%. So it can play a significant role where the crust is very thick. The sediment pile has a much lower contribution, and we always call this the, you know, the tertiary contribution or the third arm. It doesn't tend to have, because of its thickness and its fill, it doesn't tend to have a lot of radiogenic heat production. The exception being are usually deep sedimentary basins where you have thick marine shales, and the, you sometimes hear people referring to hot shales, um, and these have a lot of, um, again, particularly potassium, so generates um, radioactive material. So the thickness of the sediment of the crust also plays a different role here because it influences conductive heat transfer. So we need to understand them for two reasons, one for their heat production, but also how they transfer heat through conductivity. 
And a, a thicker crust than sediments can actually act as insulators. And the rate at which the heat from the mantle is conducted to the surface is governed by their thickness. So there's a balance to play here between producing heat and conducting heat through the lithosphere pile. And I like to imagine these layers of the earth simply as clothes. And in the same way, that where the earth is wearing thicker clothes or where in winter we wear a thicker jacket, we don't lose as much heat. And where you have thinner clothes, more heat is escaping to the surface. And we um, we want to, the objective of much of our research is to understand actually the layers that are thinner, that heat loss to the surface is greater and it makes it much more accessible at shallow, to get to heat at shallower depths. So essentially that's what the phase one portfolio of research is looking at. The layers of the earth's clothing, where is it thin, perhaps in areas that we don't even know it's thin, and how can we understand this a lot more? And the first layer we're going to look at is that lab. So what is the depth to the lithosphere asthenospheric boundary? And how do we work it out? And what are the limitations to that? So we can hopefully see that, some beautiful maps. And these maps are all available online in the tool for you to look at. And there's a little toggle in the tool that you can click and you can actually extract the values of the maps. So the lab is a very significant transition zone within the Earth's mantle, and it's characterized by a velocity contrast. So the seismic waves slow down as they pass from a very rigid lithosphere into a more ductile asthenosphere. And by an analyzing the velocity of the seismic waves, we can identify the depth of what, well, we can identify where this curves, and of course, then we can try and invert to get the depth of what this curves. So the technique is often referred to as seismic tomography, and it uses seismic waves, including shear waves, and it analyzes the travel times in the past um, from multiple sources. And these can be artificial sources, or they can be earthquakes, natural sources. And the beautifully colored map that you see on the left-hand side is actually shear wave velocity deviations from a regional average. So we always plot this relative to regional average, and we look for positives and negatives away from that average. And we also look at this in terms of time slices. And the slice here is at 110 kilometers depth. The dark purple areas that you see indicate cooler and thicker lithosphere. And you can see if you understand and know the geology of Africa well, you can pick out the Congo Kraton there, and you can see parts of the Pan-African full belt. You can also see the areas of thinner lithosphere. You can spot the ears, the cars, the SARS system propagating through between these cratons. The map on the right is the depth to the lithosphere stemospheric boundary. And you can see that there's a very strong positive correlation. However, as every geophysicist knows in this call, when you convert time to depth, it's not without its complexities. And determining that absolute thickness of each of those parts of the lithosphere is actually very difficult. And in Africa, there is a, there is a particularly unique challenge in that the cratons here are actually very small. They've been fragmented and broken up. So they're not comparable to the North American or the Australian cratons, which are actually large. And where you have these small, very thick parts of the lithosphere, there is a number of edge effects that um, around them, and these are difficult areas to resolve in terms of the wave propagation. So what we're doing is working with Sergei Lebkov's group in Cambridge, and these are, you know, well-renowned global experts in terms of utilizing seismic tomography. And his group is helping reduce the uncertainties around the thickness. And we're tackling it in two ways. The first is we're increasing the frequency and resolution of the existing global tomography database. And this is actually something his group has been doing now for probably two decades. It's, they last published a global data set in 2013, but have been ongoing and updating it ever since. The second part of this is that we will be providing more accurate information on the lateral and vertical heterogeneity within the crust. And this is something that um, people tend to ignore or they don't ignore, it's very difficult. There's a lot of variation within the crust. But if you can get a handle on that, you can um, produce a much more improved velocity model. So we're placing a lot of focus on understanding those variations. 
And if you recall in our previous slide, I mentioned the lab to me represents the 1330 isotherm, the temperature of what melt occurs. So it's therefore not a surprise when you look at the maps, you can see, particularly on the um, shear wave velocity deviation map, you can see there's a really high spatial correlation between the orange and yellow zones, which are and active quaternary volcanoes. And almost 80% of active volcanoes lie within these zones. In any conventional geothermal field, you'll see a shallowing of the lab. So this is a really fundamental piece of research in identifying areas of geothermal potential away from conventional known areas. And what I love about this map is you can see where surface volcanoes occur, but look at the area that doesn't have surface volcanoes, and yet this is all underpinned by a shallow asthenosphere, which is amazing. It opens up this massive area through the Central African Rift System, stretching into the north, the old Cretaceous Rift Basins, into the Gadamis, the Lises, over and across into the car system of Africa. So there's a huge potential when you think about the position of the lab beyond what we beyond the surface expressions that we see that we know relate to a shallowing lab. So that's why it's a massive part of our research portfolio to understand that depth in, in more detail. So that's one layer. The next layer we have is the crust and the crust is thick. I'm oh, sorry, the crust isn't thick. The, the crust is very important and understanding the crustal thickness is important for multiple reasons. One, it helps us understand the radiogenic heat production. The thickness variations are also used as an input into the velocity model to invert the shear wave data. And the thickness can also act as an insulator. So it's important in understanding the heat transfer process. So there's multiple reasons why we need to understand the thickness of the crust. And to get a better understanding of the thickness, we've actually been collaborating with Simon Stevens from the University of Cambridge. Now, this isn't a funded project of ours. This is he is part of the group that we're funding for the sediment thickness and he actually has been doing this work for the last two years and he has produced a EC, what he calls his ecm1 model and that's the earth's crustal model one and he has a vastly expanded database in terms of other crustal models that are out there with over 26,000 spot measurements of crustal thickness and these are primary, primarily come from seismic data, but the data set, interestingly and very importantly, includes seismic velocities from the sediment, the crystalline crust and the upper mantle. So it's a real treasure trove of data. And the map on the right shows the spot measurements that he has for ECM1 Africa. But just to kind of re-emphasize how vastly updated this data set is, you can see um, this is a comparison between North America, between an old and existing data set called um, CRUST1. I'm sure many of you have used it. It's actually a very common data set. It's publicly, um, it's available in the public domain. It's extensively used in global heat flow models, but you can see the comparison here. Simon's new crustal model, ECM1, highlights that in North America alone, there is variations in the crustal thickness from 15 kilometers thicker in some places, which are the red zones, or thinner, which are the blue zones, up to 15 kilometers again. And this 30 kilometer thickness variation has a massive implication for heat flow. If you understand crustal thickness, we usually say the global average is 32. Well, here we're saying seeing massive increases and decreases away from global averages. So we're really excited to incorporate this data set into our work and very pleased to be working with Simon on that. So next we have sediment thickness. Okay, so following the very same thread in terms of the crustal thickness, we are in the process of updating the global sediment thickness models. And again, the emphasis here with is the same as the crust is on improving data frequency and data quality. And the maps here are the Peru Basin from the onshore part of South Africa. It's one of the most southern basins of Africa. And on the left-hand side, you see the global sedimentary thickness from last game masters. Again, a global data set frequently used in heat flow models. 
On the right hand side, we have a grid and the constraints from our research. And this has been led by Megan Holt of Cambridge, and she's part of the same group as Simon. And we're using seismic well data to constrain the sedimentary thickness. So the map on the right, the wells are the circles and the seismic lines are, well, the seismic, the lines are the seismic. And you can see from this example alone, our data suggests that the basin reaches a maximum thickness around nine kilometers in the center. And if you compare that to the map of last day and masters, you can see it's a significant change in terms of total sediment thickness. And we're also able, therefore, we're able to more accurately constrain the depth to the basement. What you also see is a lot more variability laterally across the two maps, particularly, and this is really important, and we see this a lot in the smaller basins. And that's about our grid, that really comes down to our grid resolution or frequency of data. So we're mapping this on 0.3 degrees while most of the grids typically have a resolution of one degree. So we're really trying to refine the sediments within each of these basins. On top of producing the map, um, we also, and again, this goes back to all our layers, we really try to improve the metadata behind each of the grids. And we're providing a number of pieces of information. The first is obvious. We're providing the location of the grid, but that, or sorry, the location of the spot data points. And that means the end user can see where the constraints are and where the grid is simply being interpolated between the measurements. And that's important to understand uncertainty. So in areas where there's interpolation, there is more uncertainty than where we actually have the data. The other piece of information is the type of data, so whether it's wells, seismic reflection, but we also have ISAPAC maps um, digitized from publications, so the user will understand the type of data that they've got the information for. Behind the metadata, we'll also refer to the references we've used or the source of the original data. So that's useful um, for a variety of reasons, whether you want to understand about the uncertainties of the grid or to actually use the data set as a launch pad to dive into a particular basin and learn more. So there's a lot of metadata sitting behind the data. And I think here I just share an example of the current um, sedimentary thickness map for Africa and the data sets that are behind the map. So we've talked about the a little bit about the understanding of the thickness of the crust but we also need to understand the variations in the crustal facies because these are important constraints to both the radiogenic heat production and the conductivity of the, of the crust and we have a research program with Tecton No and Knowing Earth these are um, expert structural geologists and they, to build a structural and tectonic database and multiple data sources are used to build into this data set. And you can see those in the screen there. We subdivide them into primary data, and this is basically Landsat, radar, gravity, magnetic data, all publicly available. But we analyze and interpret these features to build up a structural and crustal model that also includes some of the igneous interpretation. These data sets are cross-checked and enhanced um, with seismic and wells where available, but obviously they're not available everywhere. But they also access a massive amount of secondary information, and this is essentially data that sits within published literature. And this is incredibly powerful. For us, what we use this for is to add information to that um, foundational database that we've built. So we can add um, details like ages of the features and their activity. So if we see a fault quite often in the public domain, we'll get some information about how the fault's moved or when it's moved and how recent. There's also information about the composition of the igneous rocks. You may be able to map an igneous body on satellite, but you don't understand the composition unless you look at the geochemistry. And that's often within public public sorry, within literature. Um, so we bring both of these data sets together to build and create a new data set essentially for both tectonics and facies. And if we think about this methodology, what it allows us to do is to build a tectonic and crustal facies framework, even in data poor areas. So 
Here is an example from the mountains of North Africa, the Hogger region. The approach taken is very much about building from those remote sensing data sets, developing a structural framework, adding in the different pieces of information about crustal facies. And there's also an audit trail. There's a map in there, as so you can see, that references the confidence. How confident are we in our interpretation? How robust is it? And that's all within the metadata, so the user can go back and look at the data and understand what's gone into building the data, how confident the interpreter is in the data, and how much. And there are suggestions of other information that would be more relevant to collect to increase or reduce the uncertainty or increase your confidence in the data set. So all of that sits behind the crustal and facies and tectonic database. I think I have an example, and again, you can access this in the map. This is the current crustal facies, faults, and the igneous occurrence for Africa that are available online. So that's the layers and their variations in their conductivity. So what do we what do we do with all these layers? Why is it important to collect them all? Well. When you have an established that understanding of lab, crust and sediment thickness and their properties, this allows us to build thermal inversion models. Um, and we chose to work with Javier Foule at Madrid, who developed, um, I don't, some of you may know it, the winter CG inversion model, which essentially gives a detailed picture of the lithosphere temperature and composition right down to 400 kilometers below the Earth's surface. And the method that he uses takes into account really how different rocks behave under different PT, sorry, temperature and pressure conditions. And the model has boundary conditions in terms of temperature. So this, the top of the model is set by the surface temperature and the base of the model is set by the 1330 isotherm, so that lab depth. And all of the research that I've described in the presentation until now, including that improvement of the inversion of S wave velocities into some sort of meaningful thermodynamic information, the improved resolution of crustal and sedimentary thickness and facies, which leads to that clearer understanding of thermal conductivity and radiogenic. And all of that goes into the model as refinements. And the data then permits us to fix the thermal conductivities in the, in the crust and in the sediment and the radiogenic heat production in the crust and the upper part of the mantle in the model. So we have these fixed boundary conditions. We fix some of the parameters within the crust and sediments. And then we just run the model to output a steady state geotherm for the lithosphere. And it does this by essentially solving multiple 1D heat conduction equations. So in, at a basic level, the model helps us understand how heat is distributed within the Earth's lithosphere, considering the ability of the mantle to conduct heat at different temperatures and pressures. So it's really solving for mantle conductivity. And one output of the model is surface heat flow grid, which is, of course, incredibly useful. And because then we can start to try and validate our results against high quality surface heat flow borehole temperature data. And it's really important here to note that we're, we're actually not looking to fix our model results to the borehole measurements. That's you can get a very false sense of um, the, the heat flow if you do that. And um, we in fact, when we identify major discrepancies between the two, it's important because it might highlight an issue with one or model inputs. It might highlight an issue with the temperature data itself in terms of its quality and robustness, or it may actually highlight an area that's moved from a purely conductive dominated system into a localized convective system, which is really exciting. Those are the sorts of areas we want to look for and focus our attentions for geothermal. So, in order to reduce which one of these is um, essentially the discrepancy, we, we do want to make sure our surface heat flow data that we're comparing in the model is valid. So here, let me introduce another of our funded projects. And that is, and you probably, oops, you still I hit something. I don't know what I've hit, but hopefully you can still see my screen. So that's the next research fund project is about validating the International Heat Flow Commission's database. 
And I suspect many of the people on this call um, have been utilizing this database for decades now. It, I certainly have. I'm a complete user and abuser of it. The data set is, represents 60 years of data collection. It's a phenomenal resource. However, if you're a user, you will understand that the data is a mess. In right hands, the data is useful. In the wrong hands, it's dangerous and can be misleading. It's really quite variable. And there's a number of issues around the data and the historical database. And most of those issues relate to the metadata. And it, there's a lack of it in certain in, um, in certain inputs. And the data has been acquired by different techniques. There's different tools. The tools have evolved over those 60 years. There's different precisions on the tools. Some of the data points in there have been averaged from multiple vertical intersections. Some have been averaged spatially based on data and have one data point for one basin rather than multiple. Some have been extracted from paper journals, but with missing metadata that actually exists in the journals, but the values have just been extracted. Some have been corrected, but the method of correction hasn't been documented. So in its raw form, the data set is hugely confusing and often misleading. And if we want to utilize its value, the data set needs modernization and it needs to be updated. And that's exactly the mission of the International Heat Flow Commission. And Project Innerspace is funding the program to accelerate the modernization of the data. And the team have developed this wonderful quality grade scheme that the user can understand the uncertainty around the data. And so matching models to the data without understanding its quality could be incredibly misleading. And the scheme developed plus the input of missing metadata will really help ensure the user to, that they won't avoid, they will avoid those pitfalls. And this is a two year funded project. Actually, it's the longest project that we have funded and it will correct for both the onshore and the offshore heat flow database. Actually, there's a lot of emphasis from the IHFC to do the offshore heat flow data. So not overly applicable to geothermal in its current form or perhaps in its future, future form. So that's another one of our projects. And I think you can get the underlying theme. This is all about improving data quality, improving data resolution. So next one up, we've talked quite a bit. Um, how am I doing for time? Yeah, we're good. We've talked quite a bit about um, how we understand steady state conductive heat transfer within the lithosphere. But we do also want to understand where anomalies might occur and understand locations where convection cells might exist. And mapping out faults is a first step to understand this. And faults can serve as pathways for geothermal fluids to migrate from a deeper source to the, towards the surface. They can also enhance heat transfer within the Earth's crust and often can result in higher geothermal gradients at accessible depths. So again, this is the work of Tecton Know and Knowing Earth, and they've mapped out faults and described them, but it's not just the location of the faults. These faults have been described in terms of their stress states, so whether they're strike slip, extensional or compressional. The, da the database also documents fault movements, so are they active or inactive? So that's very important to understand dilation. And then their penetration depth is documented relative to the surface, the sediment, the basement, and the crust. So you'll be able to QC and understand which of these faults are penetrating right down to the crust or which are superficial. And collectively, all of this information about the faults helps us understand a little bit more about the architecture of these basins and where convection cells or recharge discharge zones may occur. And just as an example, the maps above compare the fault network to those of the thermal springs in Africa. And really unsurprisingly, you can observe a very close spatial correlation. So we also, if we go very quickly down. So the fault activity is an, also an important indicator for us in terms of the stress state. And mapping the active faults can help identify areas that might be prone to seismic hazards. And actually, we've been working really closely with GEM, the Global Earthquake Monitoring Guys, to understand their seismic hazards and their active faults. So we have a few more active faults mapped than they have, and that data will go into their 
predictive seismic hazard model, which you can see on the right hand side of the screen. We know that earthquakes typically occur around the unstable areas, plate boundaries, collision zones, and then and therefore they're very common in geothermal regions. However, while their presence may indicate potential, they obviously can cause problems in executing geothermal products or projects. Sorry. So what we wanted to do is take our knowledge of the active faults and couple it with regional stress stable data to actually help and guide users to understand a little bit more about the stress regimes of individual fault blocks. So we have this project that we're building on our tectonics database, essentially, to understand stress. And we know that knowledge of present day tectonic stresses is essential for geothermal exploration. It helps understand the magnitude and location of induced seismicity, it helps understand improving the stability of boreholes, it can even enhance fluid production through the natural fractures of the system. And you require a lot of details of the present day stress, magnitude and orientation at each reservoir interval to really understand those. But the starting point of all of that is around knowledge of horizon maximum horizontal stress orientation and that's a first input and that's what we're trying to utilize here so we know that even a plate scale correlation of max maximum horizontal stress with plate motions you can see that in areas where you have very high resolution stress data sets and these are particularly from oil and gas activity and sedimentary basins it indicates that the local maximum horizontal stress can be very variable to the regional horizontal stress. And that variation can occur between fault blocks and can be highly altered from the dominant stress direction. So we recognize this. And what we wanted to do was produce an individual fault block map of every fault block based on the tectonics that we had mapped out. Um, Michael Nemchok, who I have co-authored many books with um, and papers, is leading this and his team um, on utilising the fault maps from Techno Know and Knowing Earth to create a map of individual fault blocks. And, these, and then we highlight which of these blocks contain stress data and which don't, and what are the size of the individual blocks. And the map you see on the right is the interpretation of the fault block polygons from the previous work and it's color coded by area and we combine this with the data from the world stress map and when you look at the map on the left the polygons colored green highlight the fault blocks excuse me where there's stress data available in that database for that particular polygon and so many of these fault blocks have no available stress data and in, the, in these areas there would be an increased uncertainty around the stress state prior to doing any exploration for geothermal. So we wanted to highlight this to our users as an element of risk and uncertainty into a geothermal project in these areas. So that's something we added onto the tectonics data set. So basically what we've got to um, is this, we've touched on all seven of our research projects and I hope you've now got a flavour of how we are focusing on data quality, data refinements, and we look to build our understanding of the Earth's layer and project, produce a robust foundation to the exploration triangle. Um, we've touched on our creation of thermal inversion models to understand conductive heat processes, but we've also tried to be predictive in the tool and we've added some other features into the GeoMark including weighted overlay analysis to understand geothermal favorability. So those are those are also in there. But I think we're running, I, I'm no, noticing it's quarter two, so we're probably running out of time. And I would suggest go into the tool and have a look at the weighted overlay analysis and get in touch with me if you want to know more. I think I never touched on our partnership with Google, but we're in partnership on this project with Google, but most importantly, I want to um, say a massive thank you to my phase one research and development team of global experts that have really contributed all this data and done an amazing job in just probably just seven months to deliver these products for Africa and will continue to roll out across the globe.